at verse 6. Where are we going to pick it up? Revelation chapter 14 at verse 6. Give you a second to turn in your Bible there. How many people think next Sunday morning we should have Sunday school over at Moonstone Beach by Cambria? I'm all set to go. <laughs> all right, looks like there's some momentum building for that. Yeah, there we go. Load it up. Yep. Beautiful. If only they used our tax dollars to build a, a high-speed rail from Fresno to Cambria. <laughs> well, ultimately, it'd be nice if they had a high-speed rail that went anywhere. <laughs> I, I, yep, I, th I think as things unfold, we... If this isn't the last generation before the second coming, uh, our great-great-grandkids are going to be out going, what are those things? And they go, oh, those were where they were going to build this thing called a high-speed rail one day. But Anyhow, Revelation 14 and verse 6, we are ready to start. And it's pretty simple geometry to think that if you look at that, and here's this ray of sunlight, and here's a ray of sunlight, and here's a ray of sunlight. If you just extended those above the cloud, that's right where the sun would be. But in reality, the sun would be millions and millions and millions of miles back there. And I've always wondered and thought it's kind of a phenomenon that when the sun is so far back there and the sun is bigger, much bigger than the earth, and the light coming from it should just, any place there's a hole in a cloud on earth, all the light should come down parallel in shafts. But it doesn't. And so it gave rise, I think, maybe that's one of the reasons why people had the idea that there was stuff up there kind of at the top of our atmosphere, and that was called midheaven. And John said he saw this angel fly in midheaven. And so based on that word, there are many who have taken the view that this is actually something that will be seen on earth that all of the other angelic activity, the hosts of angels in the throne room, the angels that are there when they worship and praise God, the angels that sound the trumpets, the angels that pour out the vials, and, and so many other things, the angels that um, you know, have the tongues and the fire and those kinds of things, that all of those are things in heaven that will not be seen on earth, but that these three particular angels will actually be seen by the residents of earth. And let's look at that and, and kind of kick that idea around for a minute. In Revelation 8.13, it's the other place in the book of Revelation where this word midheaven is used. In Revelation 8.13, it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices, of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So we actually have a total of four angels that John sees flying through midheaven, making an announcement. Um, and in each instance, they cried out with a loud voice. So the question is, are these going to be visible? Are they going to be seen? If they are, when and why? And how does this all fit together? So I liked to compare scriptures, and I noticed in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus gives his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25, talking about the last days, uh, the days preceding his immediate return, I, I noticed that there is the statement in Matthew 24, 14, if you want to turn there, uh, we can look at that as a cross-reference, and and we can see some possibilities here. Now I'm going to tell you this is one of those areas where I, I think it's difficult to be dogmatic. But there certainly is enough said in the Bible to make a case. I think that this, these three angels will actually be visible and seen by people on earth. 
it's, again, it's hard to be dogmatic. The vast, in fact, pretty much all of the other angelic appearances that John sees in the book of Revelation uh, would seem to be reserved for things going on in heaven and not visible to earth up until the second coming of Christ when he comes back accompanied by an angelic host. But up until that time, it would seem that, it would seem that by and large the angels that John saw in heaven are not revealed to those of us on earth. But these four angels could well be the exception to what otherwise might be a rule. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And so we've often believed, well, we always have believed that the gospel will be preached worldwide. There are any number of mission agencies which have used this verse to say <clears throat> that when we support missions and support spreading the gospel worldwide, we hasten the return of Christ. The argument being that Christ won't come back until the gospel's preached worldwide, so we have to send out missionaries worldwide so that Jesus can come back. I'm not sure I quite buy into that logic, but I understand it. And so the statement here that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached worldwide and in the context, uh, it's in the tribulation period, I noticed that then in verse 15, Jesus immediately then refers to the abomination of desolation. And so it would seem arguably if there is intended to be something of a sequence in the events that Jesus gives in his sermon in Matthew 24, and there does seem to be at least a general sequence of events because he starts off saying you'll hear of this and see of this, but the end's not yet. And then you're going to see this and see this. Well, that means you're getting close. And then when you see the, the abomination of desolation, boom, that's a dead giveaway that you're smack dab in the middle. And so he does give some sequence, and then the sermon ends, of course, with the second coming. So there is a general progression or a sequence of events. This being in verse 14 mentioned before the abomination of desolation would certainly lend support to the idea that possibly... Matthew 24, 14 is talking about what John sees here in Revelation 14. That the preaching of the gospel worldwide is not accomplished through necessarily through missionaries, though we incline to think that the 144,000 are certainly going to have a role in that. But it may also be at least partially completed or accomplished by an angel that would simply fly or circle around the earth and would be seen and heard by everyone uh, proclaiming the gospel. Now, if that's the case, if you stop and think about it, if that's the case, then you have to understand that there would have to be some kind of an accompanying miracle for everybody to hear it in their own language. Because there are plenty of it says that, uh, well, I didn't finish reading verse 14. It says that, uh, he would have the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So if you're preaching the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and one angel's doing the preaching, and it's going to obviously be a, a time-sensitive, time-limited event, he's not going to be up there for hundreds of years doing it, uh, then as he proclaims his message, there would have to be an accompanying miracle for all the different people on earth to hear that message in their own language. And, and so it, it is somewhat mindful or similar to the day of Pentecost where Peter and the apostles uh, speak in tongues and these people from around the world that were Jewish people who were scattered in the, in the earlier dispersions and judgments hundreds of years earlier, they've come now, their ancestors who were dispersed, but they have come to Jerusalem to keep this feast of Pentecost. And they hear, they said, um, that Peter and the apostles praising God in their own language, which they recognized as some kind of a miracle or something because uh, apparently the, the apostles had a thick Galilean accent, whatever that was. 
And so they recognize that they're from Galilee, they have that accent, they weren't raised in our countries. So how could we possibly hear all of them speaking in all these different languages? Well, it was a miracle. It was a miracle of God and Peter identified it as a miracle. And he said, it's a miracle identifying the fact that the Holy Spirit's been poured out and given to us. And so uh, this would have to be somewhat similar to that. I'd like to take you back to the book of Isaiah and to chapter 66. Well, the, no, it, 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 the question is, um, the upper room while they were waiting for the day of Pentecost, was there any involvement with speaking in tongues there? And the, sh the short answer would be no. That did not begin until the day of Pentecost. Okay, it's the, the gift of speaking in tongues is mentioned on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. It's inferred uh, when the Samaritans get the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 8. It's specifically mentioned in Acts chapter 10, and Peter explains it in Acts 11, why it happened. And then it occurs again in Acts chapter 19, when Paul meets some uh, disciples of John the Baptist at Ephesus, and then it's mentioned at the church of Corinth. It was also predicted to occur in Mark 16, chapter verses 17 and 18, but those are the only places it's mentioned in the Bible. Not that we want to marginalize or something has to be mentioned a certain number of times before we take it seriously, but those are the references and places where we're st it's stated to have occurred. We don't have any evidence that it occurred any other times or any other places, but we don't have proof that it didn't occur at some other times and places. So in Isaiah 66, uh, this is a passage that has just kind of intrigued me. Um, you know, I've studied and gone through a lot of this stuff many, many years, many, many times. I have a lot of good commentaries. But then, you know, I get some of these new Bible study programs. You've heard me talk about them. Um, they have more books than I'll ever live long enough to read even a fraction of them. And now one of my other uh, Bible study programs, Logos, bought that whole thing, and they're transporting all those books into Logos. So I will have just in my Logos Bible study program well over 4,000 books that I can access on my computer. And if you get eSword and start downloading the free stuff, you can add another couple thousand volumes of study books for free. And so as I said, they, you have available on the internet more resources than you can probably ever live long enough to use. But it's nice to have them, and I, since I do have them, I like to go back over my notes and instead of just instead of just printing off some notes from yesteryear and saying, well, that's all done. Um, I like to go back and do every lesson. I like to print out the text and study through it and go through it. Uh, and after I'm all done doing it all over again, then I like to look at my old lesson and compare and see how it compares to my thoughts from maybe several years ago. Well, in doing that, in one of my Bible study programs, they cross-referenced Isaiah 66, 19, which I must confess I've not really studied uh, to any great degree. And so Jesus here in, or I'm sorry, the prophet Isaiah in verse 19 said, and I will set a sign among them and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish, Pul, and Lud that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan to the isles of far off uh, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles, and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon the horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And verse 18, he, he laid the context when he said, he rebukes their idolatry, and he's saying that there are those who are secretly practicing idolatry. But in verse 18, the Lord says, I, I know their works and their thoughts, meaning their sinful so thoughts, their secret sins. And it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And then the Lord said, I will set a sign among them. So the big question here is, what is the sign? And I went through a lot of Old Testament commentaries and references, seeing what other people who'd studied this has concluded was the sign. And
And the sum total of what I found out is nobody really knows for sure. <laughs> so after a lot of time sitting at my computer reading a lot of material, we came to the conclusion that we're not really sure. Now there's a lot of ideas. And it's almost like this is in the category of who is the Antichrist or what's his name, the mark of the beast kind of thing, where when people see that, they just cannot resist coming up with a theory. Um, and they just cannot resist taking a guess or a whack at who it might be. And, and so there's plenty of ideas and suggestions, but many people focused on Matthew 24, where it says at the second coming that God said, then he would give the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which most people think is the actual appearance of Jesus himself in the heavens before he comes down to the earth. But that really doesn't work here because he said he's going to set a sign. It can't be the second coming because he said then those that escape will go to the nations and they'll preach the gospel, in essence, to the Gentiles who haven't heard. That just doesn't fit in with the second coming. I mean, at the second coming, the Bible says the angels go out and gather all the unsaved to the valley of judgment there at Israel. So who are those that escape and what is this sign? And how they've got to go and they've got to preach the gospel and people have to be saved. And then these people that get saved ultimately will come to Jerusalem to, hear the, to worship the Lord because they heard the gospel, they got saved. And, and now they will come to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. So to me, the sign seems to fit a whole lot better uh, around a lot of the events of the middle of the tribulation or thereabouts. Uh, because if the sign is given, whatever it is, it's going to be something that's going to be staggering and stunning to the world. And then he said, those that escape... Uh, but who are they that escape? So, so as I've studied this, I, wanna, I just want to kick around a few options on this. And I think it's, you might think about it and pray about it. And you might actually come up with some ideas. Uh, there's a lot of Old Testament cross-references. And I confess I did not have time to trace down every possible cross-reference uh, that I had in the Old Testament. If you look at the, the, the Bible cross-reference systems in a study Bible, They'll take you to this reference, which takes you to two more references, and each of those takes you to two or three more references, and those take you to two references, and, and it pretty soon it just keeps spreading out and out and out. It gets, can get pretty massive. So I haven't traced all of the suggested cross-references. I looked at some, and I wasn't sure why they were even listed as cross-references. I didn't see the connection. But the sign, there's some possibilities here. One thing that the Bible says we have the seal judgments in the first half of the tribulation, the revelation of the Antichrist, and I believe in the first year of the tribulation that Russia invades Israel and they sweep through the Middle East, North Africa, and set up a military base there in Israel. And the Bible says that God rains down fire and brimstone and destroys this Russian confederacy and their army and he also burns the motherland where they came from and that five-sixths of the people in the motherland are also destroyed in this judgment. And he says that he burns those that dwell carelessly in the isles, that is, in the far coast from Jerusalem or from Israel. He burns them with fire as well in this judgment. Now that could well be a sign in the first year and that could well be referring to where God says, I'll gather nations uh, in other words, he's going to let this Russian confederacy sweep in through the Holy Land. He's going to destroy them. Well, that's clearly going to be a sign. And it well could be that that's the sign Isaiah's talking about. And that those who have escaped this fire and brimstone raining down and destroying this Russian confederacy, that sign could well be a catalyst that triggers the salvation of the 144,000 who in turn are involved in preaching the gospel worldwide. That's possible. It's also possible that the angels flying through the midst of heaven around the middle of the tribulation could be the sign. That the Bible talks about gods who will give signs in the heavens above and signs on the earth. And that well could also be a sign. When I look at the 
uh, announcement of the three angels and the sequence of their announcements. In other words, the, the uh, and I put that here in your notes, uh, and I'm going to jump up to mind that the first one talks about preaching the everlasting gospel. The second one announces that Babylon is fallen. And the third one is a, a warning of a curse on those who take the mark of the beast. So it would make sense to me that the third angel, certainly, that his warning would have to come right around the middle of the tribulation when the mark of the beast is instituted. I, I mean, it really wouldn't make any sense to send an angel to warn people about taking the mark of the beast at the end when it's pretty much settled. <laughs> I mean, everybody's either decided yes or no at that point. So that, that really doesn't make sense to me. And the more I studied on this portion of scripture, the more I came to the conclusion that I think the destruction of Babylon, the city, is also at the middle of the tribulation. Um, I used to assume and think that it was right near the end. But as I've looked at this and, and went back and started looking at Revelation 17 and 18, I think the destruction of Babylon is also at the middle. It's clear that there's a lot of activity at the middle of the tribulation. When we put all the information together, it says there's the war in heaven. And the Michael and his angels kick out the devil and the demons who were allowed access to go in before God and accuse believers of sin and ask permission to torment them or to chasten them in some way. They're kicked out and banished. And the Bible says that now they're restricted to the earth. And so... When that happens, that's when John sees these two beasts rise up. And that's when the Antichrist, who was the leader of the revived Roman Empire, he now will become literally possessed by the devil. And he now will go into the rebuilt Jerusalem temple. And he will stop Jewish worship. He will claim that he is God. He will demand worship by all. And the false prophet will do signs and wonders to verify that he is the Savior and demand that people worship him as their Savior. And they will begin executing all those who won't take the mark of the beast. You have to take the mark of the beast to show that you've accepted the Antichrist as your Lord and Savior. And if you don't, they'll cut your head off. And so we see all of these things happening right in the middle of the tribulation. And it's well possible that the destruction of Babylon is also at that time. And it's possible that these three angels fly through the midst of heaven, the mid-heaven, if you will, the upper atmosphere. And they proclaim these messages with a loud voice. And people on earth hear and see it. That's also very possible. And so the angel preaching the gospel to the world I think, is going to be something that is going to be seen and heard here on earth. Now, some would say, well, the angel makes his announcement and it's commissioning the 144,000. And they're the ones talked about in Isaiah 66 that escape and they go out and preach the gospel. I'm more inclined to think it's both. But again, I can't be dogmatic about it. But I'm more inclined to think 144,000 are going to be involved in evangelism. And I'm also inclined to think that this angel is going to be involved in proclaiming the gospel. I, I think that the Bible is teaching that every person in the tribulation period, every person will hear the gospel. And every person will choose either Christ or the Antichrist. By the end of that seven-year period of time, there won't be anybody who will say, I didn't hear, I didn't know, I haven't made my choice. Uh, it'll be one or the other. So that when Christ comes back, there won't be any middle ground. So I love studying prophecy, and I think it's fun to compare those verses. You might study them and think on them and decide what you think the sign is in Isaiah 66. Uh, there are a number of options but remember, whenever the sign is given, there have to be those who escape and go out to the Gentiles and have time to preach the gospel and, and people have then a chance to be saved so that they can come and worship the Lord. And they have to be people who haven't heard the gospel. 
So we got to kind of factor all those pieces in together. And I have to say this also, the more I study prophecy, the more I recognize that in one sentence, where two or three things are given in a sentence, there can be time gaps between those things. The fact that two or three things are mentioned in a sentence doesn't mean they all occur just boom, boom, boom at a row or right together. And that's a principle we learned from Daniel 9, where he said there's 70 weeks. Here's the start, Nehemiah 2. Here's the first 69 weeks. Then Messiah comes. He's cut off, but not for himself. And the, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the temple. And then the 70th week begins when he makes a covenant with me. So we know there's a gap. We have just a couple of verses describing the 70th week of Daniel, but we know that it identifies a gap from Messiah to the destruction of the temple was at least a 40-year gap. And as it turns out, it's 40 and counting. <laughs> that, that from Messiah to the Antichrist signing the covenant with Israel to, I think, restore worship, and then the second coming of Messiah, uh, it's 2,000 years pretty much in counting as we sit here. And so the fact that two things are, might be mentioned even in the same verse in the Bible doesn't mean that they occur at exactly the same time. And on a lot of these prophecies, if you list the things it says and take other ones, you find that some of these things kind of interleave together. That here's a statement in this verse, and then here's a second statement, but over here, this verse gives some things that are tucked in between those two, and you have to interleave it. And that's why, since some have said that a third of the Bible concerns prophetic statements, that's why we have so many people studying the Bible coming up sometimes with different ideas. Because it's all, you just can hardly live long enough to study all of them and interleave them all together. That's one reason I do like to read some commentaries on prophecy, because... There's a lot of guys who focused on a specific verse, a specific topic, a specific book of the Bible and spent years studying it. And they have a lot of insights to offer there and I, I wanna enjoy those. So the first angel flies through mid heaven. He has a gospel message. It says having the everlasting gospel to preach that them that dwell on the earth. This is why I inclined to think that he will be seen and heard by the people on earth because it doesn't really read in such a way as it sounds like he's commissioning others to go. It sounds like he himself is preaching it. And if mid-heaven refers to what it commonly referred to in Bible times, then that would put him being revealed in the upper atmosphere of earth, being seen and heard by the people of earth, and that he would simply, as it were, circle the earth, proclaim the gospel, and every person, it says, would hear it, in his own tongue. I mean, it specifically says, to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so every person in every language will hear this message. Now, we also see then that there is a second, or in verse seven, it describes in detail what he says. He's saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now many have focused heavily on the fact that here it says he has the everlasting gospel. And if you go through the Bible and do a word study on the word gospel, you'll find that it has any number of additional words associated with it. Paul referred to God judging people according to my gospel. It's called the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. It's called a number of different, referred to in a number of different ways. But I believe that the gospel starts in Genesis 3.15. It has the core elements of sin, penalty, and a Messiah who would come, the seed of a woman, who would offer an escape from the penalty of our sin that those are the core elements of the gospel. And as we go through the Bible, we see additional information given, but those core elements never change. And so some look at this and have said, well, because the word the doesn't occur in front of this reference to the gospel, 
that it's not really a gospel. Well, I, I would have to say, well, the word gospel means good news. And this certainly focuses on the coming judgment of God. It certainly focuses on a warning that God is pouring out his judgment on earth now. And at the second coming, it's going to be death for everybody who's unsaved. So we know that, that the warning component is here and it's powerful. But when I read in commentaries that they say, well, this isn't really... Uh, a, a gospel, it's just an announcement of doom. But as I said, the word gospel itself means good news. So if all it is is a proclamation of doom, uh, then it really isn't good news. <laughs> if I said, oh, by the way, you probably didn't hear, China has launched some nuclear weapons, one's headed for Fresno, it'll be here in about 15 minutes. So if you want to call somebody and say goodbye, this would be the time to do it. <laughs> I mean, you'd, you'd say, well, that certainly is an announcement, and it certainly is a strong announcement of doom, uh, but there's not much good news in there. So as I look at this, he says, fear God. Well, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We know that when we read in the New Testament, the fear of God is certainly referred to numerous times. And the reason you should fear God is because we've sinned and are condemned, because the wages of sin is death. And so when this angel calls upon people to fear God, he certainly has tucked in there the inference of sin and judgment and condemnation. And when he says, give glory unto him, I believe that is translating into the idea of admit your sin and you need to seek forgiveness through faith in Christ. Now, there have been the two witnesses there in Jerusalem, and they have been preaching. There's been a lot of media coverage, undoubtedly, for uh, the Bible and things the Bible says. And he continues, he said, for the hour of his judgment is come. And, and I think when he says, fear God and give glory unto him, for the hour of his judgment is come, I think he's saying, and do it now. Don't be putting this off. You can't keep kicking the can down the road on when you're going to deal with your soul in eternity. And then fourthly, he says, and worship him. So in order to worship God, you can only do that by receiving the son. Because Jesus said, no man cometh unto the father, but by me. So you have to come to the father through the son. And I don't see this announcement of good news as contradictory to anything else that we see preached uh, or referenced in gospel preaching. Uh, I just see it as the angel kind of dialing down the focus to the people on earth and, and giving them a straight, solid uh, challenge, if you will, that uh, maybe you've delayed, maybe you haven't heard, maybe whatever, but the time to make a decision is now because God's judgment is upon us. And so we don't know that there isn't additional information given, but we know certainly this is the heart of his message. I see it as completely compatible with the other uh, information we have in the Bible about the gospel. And I think it is an announcement of good news uh, because worship him, if this was just a message of doom, if this was just a message saying basically uh, God's judgment has come and your goose is cooked. Well, that, not only would that not be good news, why would an angel say fear God, give glory to him and worship him if people couldn't repent and do that? And, and if it was at the end of the tribulation and everybody's either taken the mark or already decided to serve Christ, uh, it would be kind of a pointless time to announce it at that time. So. That's why I think this happened somewhere around the middle of the tribulation, possibly even earlier. And then there are two more angels that follow. Now, it doesn't mean that you look into the heavens and there goes angel one, here comes angel two, and here comes angel three. The three angels could appear in separate appearances. Uh, that's possible. Uh, most of the attention has been focused on the first angel in the gospel. Uh, very little attention in the commentaries was 
given to the idea that the second or third angels might be visible or seen or heard on earth. They were viewed simply as announcing information for John to include in his book of Revelation. But it says in verse 8, and there followed another angel saying, so if the first angel flies through midheaven and the second angel follows him, and midheaven is actually the upper atmosphere of the earth, and this angel followed him, it seems to me that the point is that he's there and visible and seen as well. And he says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I've never really studied a lot to try and nail down uh, when the fall of Babylon is. Uh, but looking at these three angels and when uh, they might make their announcements and the timing of it has kind of led me uh, to lean heavily towards Babylon being destroyed at the middle. It would make sense to me that when the Antichrist and the false prophet come on the scene and the Antichrist wants to proclaim that he and he alone is God, that this Babylonian system of worship really becomes competition. If you go back to the Tower of Babel, and Alexander Hislop wrote a book on this, although I want to hasten to add, Hislop in his book made a number of assertions where he took the facts of how the Babylonian religion has spread out on a worldwide basis, and he gives some good evidence for that. He has made some leaps from there into arguing that like Christmas and Easter are part of the Babylonian religion, uh, which has really been debunked since then. I know, that, I know it's popular, I know a lot of Christians uh, that believe, uh, based on Hislop's book, that Easter and Christmas are pagan holidays. Uh, I think that his book is completely wrong. He doesn't offer any proof or evidence to verify that, and since then I think others have shown that that's just not fair. But aside from that, his book on the two Babylons showing in Babel and Nimrod uh, and how the mother-son cult of worship has spread throughout the world and the elements of it that you find in Greek and in Roman and then down into Egyptian and Assyrian and just all these other world religions, how you just find evidences of the same thing. And by the time of the New Testament, uh, these were referred to as the mystery religions. And in fact, it one of the churches was warned because it said Satan's going to come and set his seat there. And in point of fact, uh, we know that leaders of this, these mystery religions uh, left the east, like the area of the region of Babylon, the city itself, and came and settled there in that region on the Mediterranean. So there's a lot of evidence and a lot of historical background to that. And Babylon is pictured both as a system, a, a pagan system that has been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. But in the book of Revelation, the focus comes down to the city, which becomes the headquarters for that Babylonian religion in the tribulation period. And it, it, to me, it just would make sense. In 17 and 18, when we get there, we'll see that it says the 10 kings burned the city of Babylon, this headquarters, with fire. It would make sense to me if the Antichrist comes on the scene and says, I'm God, everybody has to worship me, that Babylon could well be viewed as competition to people worshiping him. And, and so that he has the kings of the earth that support him in this revived Roman Empire burn it with fire. So the, when it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, some say, well, repeating something is just a rhetorical device for emphasis, meaning it's fallen, and I mean, boom, done, gone, over, completely obliterated. So doubling it like that could have that uh, meaning, but it also could have the idea that it's uh, referring to both the system which has been around for thousands of years, and the city where it's currently headquartered, which will be crushed and destroyed in the tribulation period. So again, it, it makes the most sense to me on timing this 
that it would be a mid-trib right in there event. Uh, I haven't found anything yet where I can say it really dials it in just boom right here. But at least I think that's probably uh, when it occurs. I, I, at first I thought it was really part of the end of the tribulation and associated with the second coming of Christ, but the more I've read and studied it, the more I've realized, no, that's not really correct because uh, there's a bunch of stuff that is said to occur after the destruction of Babylon. So that you still have the ten kings, you still have the merchants, you still have this and that and people bemoaning it. So if this happened like right at the second coming of Christ, none of that would occur. Uh, there wouldn't be any of that stuff going on. So the second an angel announces that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so this wine of the wrath of her fornication uh, is a reference to the spiritual adultery into which she has led people. Uh, James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so friendship with the world and the world system is viewed as spiritual adultery combining what God intended to be holy and sacred and set apart strictly for him, combining it with pagan elements which are false and, and would compromise what God intended to be pure and holy. In Revelation 17, 2, it says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So Babylon uh, is seen to be a prominent feature, I think, at the time of the tribulation, and this city Babylon, where it's headquartered, will rise to prominence. Now, hopefully between today, chapter 14, and when we get to chapter 17 and 18, hopefully in between I'll figure out what and who and where Babylon is. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a whole lot of ideas on that subject. Um, I, I've read books that state it's America. Uh, I've read books that state the ancient city of Babylon itself will be rebuilt. Um, I know that there in uh, um, Iran, which is where, no, it's Iraq. Iraq is where physical Babylon is located on the Euphrates River. Uh, and now my mind just went blank on the leader there when, when Bush number one invaded Iraq and took him out of power uh, over the whole big debate. Did they have the weapons of mass destruction and all of that stuff going on? Uh, that he took him out of power, that he had allocated millions and millions of dollars to rebuild ancient Babylon and was starting in on that program. So I thought it's interesting that he was actually trying to rebuild the ancient city and he got whacked and taken out. And so, is Babylon the real city rebuilt? If it is, then that means that we still have a ways to go before we prophetically get to the time of the tribulation period because uh, right now, there, if that's what happens, those pieces are nowhere near in place. Is Babylon a reference to Rome? Because there's a, a strong argument uh, that Babylon refers to the city of Rome, but some of the description of Babylon at this point doesn't really fit, and that's why some have argued that Babylon must be New York or America or some such thing as that, but I don't really see the description fitting there as well. So hopefully by the time we get to chapter 17 and 18, the Lord will have shown me and we can get that figured out. But one thing is clear. Babylon represents false religion, and false religion will be destroyed. And God is against false religion, and the fact that he hasn't destroyed it yet doesn't mean that he condones it or accepts it. It means that he has delayed judgment because the fact is, is that millions and millions of people will be in heaven who were once in false religions or their parents or grandparents were in false religions 
And so if God had destroyed those things in the past or already, then a lot of us wouldn't even exist. And so God has allowed those things to exist, but it doesn't mean he condones them. And the Bible gives a clear warning, they will be destroyed. So we have come to the third angel and we are out of time for today. So Lord willing, we will pick it up next week on the announcement of the third angel. And you can go home and study Matthew 24 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Isaiah 66 and then dovetail that with Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And then next week you can come back and say, Brother Woodley, I got it all dovetailed in together, fits perfect. And that'll save me a lot of work. I'd really appreciate if you'd do that, really. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you know, I, to me, I mean, studying prophecy is like sitting down with a bowl of popcorn or a bag of candy or something like that. I just love doing it. But it's amazing. You can sit there and read and study for several hours, and then you kind of sit back and you go, I think I got more questions now than I did when I started studying. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to the prophetic picture, and getting them to all fit together is, is no small task, but there is an inherent benefit in studying Bible prophecy. Whether or not we get all the pieces and parts to fit together perfectly, whether or not we come to the place where we really understand everything that's humanly possible for us to understand right now today, whether we ever get to that point or not, the Bible says just studying prophecy makes us think about the future, makes us think about heaven, and it motivates us to start living a holy life in preparation for eternity with the Lord. So there's an inherent value in studying Bible prophecies. I know sometimes people say, well, pastor, if you don't know, all the, if you don't know who the Antichrist is, if you don't know the mark of the beast, if you don't know this, if you can't tell us the day, if, what's the point in studying all this? Well, just God put tons of this stuff in there for us to read and study to motivate us to holy living. He didn't put this all in here so that just one group of people right before the second coming could read and enjoy it and study it and say, oh, yeah, we get it. He put this in here so every Christian in every country, in every age, and in the Old Testament, what they had there could have this to study it and read it and challenge them to prepare for eternity with God. Father, we thank you and praise you for the word. And Lord, we just pray the Holy Spirit will help us to understand as much as we can. But we do, uh, Father, claim your promise that it will motivate us and challenge us and encourage us to holy living. May it be so in each of our lives today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.